Good evening, everyone. And we are in our final chapter of chapter three. But as we begin, I want to draw our attention back to the purpose of this book. When Nahum started this book in chapter one, it says the burden against Nineveh. The idea here is that this is a, how would you say, something really heavy, right? Something heavy. It's called a burden because the words that are being uttered through the mouth of Nineveh, uh, through the mouth of Nahum against Nineveh is really heavy. This is not a, 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 an utterance of, of congratulating them or, or blessing them. This is really telling them what is going to come as a consequence of all their actions. And, and I guess the word burden is it's not, it's not adequate, I guess. And we have gone through two chapters, chapter one and chapter two. Too. And we can see that the words that are said with regards to Nineveh is really harsh. And the vision that is presented as what is what has happened to uh, Nineveh uh, when they first conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And it is said when they positioned themselves later on against Jerusalem. That would be a problem. And so that is said to be going against God. Now, the, 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 the timing of this book is sometime from Hezekiah to, to, to uh, Manasseh. And, and basically, the northern kingdom has already been wiped out by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom has been met with God's punishment against them and they went back with the well I guess we can say with the tail between their legs but as time went on the Assyrian Empire has to realize that the words that Nahum is giving is incredibly important to them that they will come upon a time where they will meet their demise now one of the hardest things to say to a king is when at the height of their power that they are going to fail and they are going to lose. And hence, that would be the burden against Nineveh. We are now in chapter 3. And chapter 3 wraps up the burden that Nahum is giving. And it says here, uh, hoi, the, the word wo basically means hoi. It, it's, it's really an exclamation. The exclamation is like, oh dear, no? That, that, that's, that's the kind of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exclamation of, of despair. It says, hoi, to the bloody city. It is actually, uh, it really means uh, a town of blood, right? A town of blood. And, and basically you find that when you talk about a town of blood, right here, it means that it sheds, right? It sheds innocent blood. And I think it's important for us to realize that it doesn't matter whether they are part of Israel or not part of Israel. In Genesis chapter 9, God gave these instructions before, way before Israel uh, was ever formed. And God said in Genesis chapter 9 that you are not to take the life of another person. And so shedding blood, literally means killing another person. And why would God be angry with Nineveh and calling it the town of blood? Is because 
It does oppress innocent people. It says that it is full of lies and robberies. Its victim never departs. Full of lies. Uh, I guess you find that um, the word here is deception, I guess. Um, full of deception. I guess it doesn't, it doesn't go far from, from today's environment as well. Uh, robbery, in this case, would be plunder. It'd be literally, uh, I guess this word here really tears away the, tears away the property, okay? Tears away property from owner. So this is not like daylight robbery or anything of that nature that we are familiar in modern day terms. When it talks about robbery, it is really taking by force. The prey, victim here, really means uh, a prey. It's someone who will, well, I guess a victim is a good word, uh, but literally it means prey. And the prey uh, never departs. The word departs here means they are not withdrawn. They, they, they don't go away. They, they do not go away. The noise of a whip, the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. All of these gives you a picture of the invading army. This is how the picture is sounding. The noise of whips, the noise of rattling wheels. This is an A and a B. The, of galloping horses, of catter, uh, cattering, clattering chariots. An A and a B. This is about the invading army and it's all over the place. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. All of these talks about the plunder. The plunder, the slaughter. And, and this is giving the picture of the slaughter of Nineveh. Now, again, it is not good news to talk about death. But chapter 3 really graphically describes how badly they will be torn apart by the eventual conquerors. And why did God allow that is because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries, families through her sorceries. What in the world does this mean? First of all, let's break this down. Harlotries of the seductive uh, harlot, uh, really harlotry would be idolatry. And we've seen that in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And the idea of sorcery uh, or witchcraft that is said here is said to be somewhat of the supernatural powers, possibly, uh, of, of, of abilities. And I would say that in the old days, whenever they talk about sorcery or magic, right? Uh, you would be familiar with the word alchemist. And the word alchemist is very much like, you know, Merlin, the magician, and all of these sorceries. They learn signs when they are able to, what we call, um, uh, where, where they are able to actually use parts of signs to actually... Uh, I guess, beguile, trick, or captivate the audience, 
right? This is sorcery, where you could have spells, you could have magic poofs, you know, fire coming out. And that is really the use of signs. Well, I guess modern day signs. But in the old days, they would be called sorceries. And verse 5 is the conclusion here of why God is saying this. Behold, look, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face, show the nations your nakedness, the kingdoms your shame. Look at what God is saying. He says, lo, I am against you. God is against you. Now, this is very important words to say. When God says, I'm against you, and he is Yehovah Tzavah'ot, he is the one who leads the army, the army of angels, or all, also that we could see the armies of the nation of Israel. But basically, when God says he is Yehovah Tzavah'ot, it gives this imagery that God is leading an army to fight. And so when God says, I am against you and you being Nineveh, just think for a second. If God goes against an, an, a, a nation like Nineveh, that would be the end of that nation. And God says, I, I will lift up your skirt. And, and the word lift up really is to remove uh, yeah, remove or to, to uncover. Okay. And the other word, it uh, talks about skirt here, is really, um, well, the, the edge. And if you talk about the edge of the coat, and... And what you would see is that in this particular instance, this is, I guess you could say that this, this is about the shame, right? This is bearing, bearing, bearing the, the shame to all, to all for them to see. And this is a very graphic word uh, or graphic passage. Basically, God is saying that I'm going to, to, to uncover you, right? It says here, uncover you. And, uh, you know, if women were wearing skirts and if the skirts cover their face, basically they are showing off their, their, inner, their, their bodies, the naked bodies. And that's what it means here by nakedness. I will show the goyim. Your nakedness, and, and this is being bare, right? That nothing is going to hide. This is your new body. And the kingdoms, your shame. And this would be a dishonor. And so all of these are talking about an A, B, and C. It's, it's really saying that God is going to show the world that Nineveh is shameful. That's verse 5. God says, I will cast abominable, abominable filth upon you. And the word abominable filth, it means to throw, how should you say? Um, this is something that is detestable. Uh Abominable, abominable filth is something detestable. Something that, how should you say, something that, um, uh, something that is dirty in the eyes of God. And it does refer to idolatry. And this would be the shame of idolatry. God says, I will throw on you. And I'll make you vile. Uh, and this word vile is 
I guess you could say that uh, it will make you wilt, decay, right? Uh, and make you a spectacle. The idea here is something that people look upon. All of these is really to view the shame of Nineveh. Notice these are all very graphic pictures of the nation. Verse 7. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will run away from you and say, Nineveh is late ways. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Now, all of these are, are actually speaking about seeing the shame and destruction. Of a major city and nation. And so whenever people come to look at Nineveh, look here in verse 7, they will flee. And the word flee means to, to run away. To run away from you. And then it says, Nineveh is late waste. The idea of late ways is destroy. They can see Nineveh is no more. It's been plundered. It's been captured. So who will, uh, who will bemoan her? Who will show grief? Right? Who will show grief? Who will be sorry for Nineveh? Then the last one is. Where do I seek? Or this word seek is to, to, to find, to, to find, to find anyone who will comfort, right? Anyone, anyone to comfort. So this is also about the destruction and it is very sad because a great nation is being destroyed. And, you know, you know one of those uh, musicals uh, uh, that has been written, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. And, and, and when a nation falls down, uh, when someone powerful uh, is, is lost uh, and, and falls from grace, it is a sad affair for all those who used to look upon them, Nineveh, as a great nation. That's, that's the picture that's being given here. So it's very imagery. Verse 8, are you better than Noamon that was situated by the river that had waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea? And... And understand this, the word Noamon. Uh, Noamon, I, I guess some, some people say this, this, is, uh, this is Thebes. But it might most likely be Alexandria. And Alexandria is the place of knowledge and, and that was the cluster of Egypt where the heart was the center of, of knowledge was. It was situated by the river Nile. They had waters around her and, and, and they were actually at the, um, the deltas. Uh, the sea would be the Mediterranean Sea. And they had a wall around the city of Alexandria. Then we look at a few names here. Ethiopia. This really is Kush. Egypt is Mitzrayim. It's Mitzrayim were her strength. 
Now, understand this. When it was at the delta, and that would be uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and then we have Kush. Kush is somewhere further. And all of these would be Northern Africa. Uh, you would find Put and Lu, uh, Lubim. Put and Lubim. Put and Lubim would be just next door, right? Put, Lubim. All of them are what we call Northern Africa today. And the center of excellence was Alexandria. It says it was boundless. Put and Lubim were your helpers. They came, they, they came to help you. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. The young children were dashed to pieces. At the head of every street, they cast the lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. So you notice all of this is by Nineveh. Although there were other people around to help, and Alexandria too, but they cannot defend Nineveh. The description given to Nineveh is that you will be drunk. The picture of you will be drunk uh, literally means they are not in uh, not in capacity to help themselves. Like somebody who is drunk, right? Like somebody who is drunk. Uh, you will be hidden or concealed. This word is concealed. You will seek refuge from the enemy. And so here would be uh, the idea that they, they really are not, meaning Nineveh are not in a position to defend herself. All your strongholds are like fig trees ripen with ripened figs. If they are shaken, when you shake the fig tree that is ripe, what's going to happen is that the ripened figs will fall into the mouth of the eater. And this is a picture of how easy to conquer Nineveh. Surely your people in your midst are women. Your, your people are women. And the gates of your land are open wide for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gate. Again, this is about how easy to conquer. And the picture here is all your people who are trying to defend the city, they're all women. Now, women is given a picture of one who are not fighters. So they, they are not the ones who defend the city. The gates of your land are wide open. They are here and, and, and you're actually welcoming your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gate. Whatever you try to block the gate, you can't. And basically, these are all very, what we call, imagery-driven words. Verse 14, draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Nick strong the built uh, brick kiln. This is a mockery against Nineveh. It is basically saying, you know, when all of these people are around you, go, go, go and defend yourself. And, and God is saying that, well, when you turn around, the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. 
this will be the destruction of Nineveh. Swift. And you can't help yourself. Like locusts coming down, you can't. Say, so make yourself many like the locusts. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. Try to defend. Try to defend. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders flies away. Understand the stars of heaven, just like um, God promising Abraham that his descendants are going to be like the stars of the skies, of the heaven. Basically, it means innumerable. Now, in, in ancient days, when it's innumerable, it means that you just can't stand there and count the heads. That's what it means by innumerable. Very hard to count. And so you have many merchants, but they all go away. The locust plunders and flies away. Verse 17, your commanders are like swarming locusts. Your generals like grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, locusts, the same. Right? These are all talking about the same A and B, which camp on the hedges on a cold day when the sun rises, they flee away. The place where they are is not known. Basically, when the enemies came, right? The enemies came, the leaders run away. This is the picture, and it's about their future. It's about their future. So let's come to the conclusion here. Verse 9, 18. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Now again, in 1 verse 1, it is Nineveh. And here is the king of Assyria. And so we are talking about the, the nation. In the book of Jonah, we are talking about the city of Nineveh. And so, as I mentioned to you earlier on in the earlier chapters, that whenever you read of Nineveh in Nahum, it's about the nation, Assyria. In Jonah, it is about the city of Nineveh. There's a king, like Sodom and Gomorrah, there are kings. And of that little area called Nineveh. But not right now, it talks about Assyria. So it says here, the, the ones who, who lead you are asleep. Your nobles are resting. Your people are scattered. No one gathers them. Basically, it's trying to tell them that they are all running away. Just like here, right? They are grasshoppers like locusts, right? They come, they eat, and they, they run. They, they go away. But verse 19 basically tells us the demise of Assyria. Your injury has no healing. Um, let's look at this. The idea of Healing uh, is about alleviation, alleviation. No solution, right? No solution, no cure. And it says your injury uh, literally means... Uh, how do you say this? Um, your fracture is like an arm fracture. Uh, it's like a broken hand, broken foot. It's, it's, you know, it's figurative of ruin. You know, when something is injured, it cannot be cured. There is no fixing this. That's what it's saying. It's no fixing this. Your wound is severe. Uh, in this case, wound means the, the carnage, 
the the slaughter the slaughter is severe and the idea is severe is is that it has it has made them well i guess it has made them very sick and 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 this is an a and a b basically it's telling minive it's 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 bad all right it's bad all who hears news of you will clap their hands over you for upon whom you have not has not your wickedness passed continually now as we come to a conclusion is this the news of minive captured basically they will clap their hands they'll clap their hands they will celebrate why because they they hate the assyrians the assyrians are well i guess short of what vulgar people violent people and and anyone whom they go and conquer they will be mistreated and god is saying that in chapter 3 assyria will face the fate that they place the other nations and they too will suffer the same consequences for whom upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually meaning he, their evil wickedness means evil and so the assyrians has always imposed evil upon the nations they conquer and now what they find is that the captors impose evil on the assyrians and there is no turning back the assyrians will definitely be wiped out and the captors will take over from there and that then ends chapter 3 and it's very interesting if you can take a look that this is the burden it's it's very difficult to 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 say these things that's what nahum is actually describing these words are heavy words it's burdensome words it's talking about people dying and in that nation they will be completely turned to ruin everyone who thinks they are powerful will all run away and the captors will come and destroy and rip apart the city and god will show the shame of assyria and nineveh to the other nations that they will come and laugh at nineveh and that will be the consequence of them serving other gods dealing with sorceries and idolatries and being evil to the people they capture and so with this gives us a clue why god is so angry with nineveh that their demise will come soon eventually uh in the later days and it will happen exactly as what nahum is actually saying and so these words talk about a syria in ways which nobody dares to say and these are words of god and with this we come to the end of the book of nahum chapter 